Joining Allison on stage, please welcome Terry Beckay, Director of Community Engagement at NOLA.com and the Picayune. Flozelle Daniels Jr., the President and CEO of the Foundation for Louisiana. T. Martin, the co-proprietor of Commander's Palace and the co-chair of the New Orleans Culinary and Hospitality Institute. And Brandon B. Mike Odoms, visual artist at Studio B. Good morning to everybody. So in doing research for this and reading all kinds of articles, there are countless news reports about New Orleans resurgence, the big comeback, that was the Atlantic, uh, the improbable and fragile comeback from Forbes. For those of us who aren't from New Orleans, should we believe what we read? Is it true? And if you think it's true, in what way? And if you think it's overstated, tell me that. Terry, I'll start with you. <laughs> oh, I get to start. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think a lot of it's true, um, but I still th think we have issues surrounding uh, um, crime, infrastructure, obviously because of, uh, uh, as evidenced, I should say, by the uh, monuments issue, um, we have a race problem mm -hmm. as well. So, um, you know, I. I think we uh, are doing okay, but we've got a lot more work. Mm -hmm. Flozell, what do you think? I think Terry's right. I, I think the overall numbers tell a story that we're doing well, and in many cases doing better. But when you start to look at the numbers and disaggregate them, you see that people of color, particularly black folk, um, have made almost no progress, and in some cases are doing worse. And so there really is a break line, um, not just about the race issue by way of our values and our way of thinking about how we feel about being in community with each other, but I believe it's going to be where we decide whether this community can grow and prosper and have another 300 years. If everyone in New Orleans and the surrounding region can't participate in the economy, in the democracy, mm -hmm. um, and in the beautiful culture that has brought folk to this place, I think we're going to struggle. T, from your point of view as a, as a restaurateur? Well, I think that things are better than they ever could have been without Katrina. I mean, you hate to have gone to the tragedy and lost the lives, obviously, but the things that have changed would have never changed, a lot of them. The, the complete, the exciting renaissance in the school system, which still needs work, but it's the fastest improving school system, you know, I think that's ever, there's ever been. So those things are thrilling and we just need to keep working on it. Um, the restaurant industry is ridiculous. I mean, I, you know, I said we had too many restaurants before Katrina, it was like 800 and something, now it's like 1600 and something. It's just, there's no way to justify that other than that restaurateurs as a group and New Orleanians as a group are both insane. I mean, there's no reasonable explanation for this. So, but ditto what my friends are saying. We got work to do and I think it's a great place to do it. My biggest fear in life is, we're a little tired. tired. A lot of New Orleanians have worked very hard and been wildly engaged in this community. Right. But we got to put the pedal to the metal, not let up. We got work to do, but we, we like to eat to out. <laughs> <laughs> you do work while you're eating out. Yes, Make it work yeah. out that way. Mike, what do you think? I feel as though uh, in the context of progress, we're trying to make sure it's not in, at the expense of the people, or at the expense of the culture, at the expense of the least amongst us. And I think that's what we're navigating. And, fighting hard to, to preserve is that the, with the idea of progress, there aren't exclusions and people aren't left out. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's something that's, that's been a battle. And so in that lens, I would say there's a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. It's to that point, Austin, Texas went through this. There used to be a, a, a slogan in Austin, keep Austin weird, mm -hmm. right? Before Dell came in and started spouting out delionaires, as they call them down there, <laughs> and changed a lot of neighborhoods hmm. quite a bit. Um, we've talked about progress and preservation. It's the motto of the city. So Terry, how do you do that? How do you think about the future, think about all that means, whilst trying to preserve all that makes you New Orleans unique and special? I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges. Um, New Orleans' lure is that it is such a great old city. 
But, um, you know, we've, uh, there've been a lot of new folks who've moved in and they've uh, moved into neighborhoods that I think like Walter said, that were sanctuaries for certain mm -hmm. people. Um, Tremé, when I was growing up, uh, I was born there, not actually in Tremé, I was at a hospital, but, <laughs> um, but um, Tremé was a sanctuary for uh, black folks and Creoles of color. And, um, and now, because of gentrification, it's, it's changed. And the personality of that neighborhood has changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, as far as history goes, it's, it's not the same place that, that I feel uh, close to. Mm -hmm. because it has changed. And I fear that that change makes it uh, vulnerable to what made it great mm -hmm. and made it a sanctuary for black folks. Mm -hmm. One of the things I, I saw which sort of crystallized this issue was of the tricentennial merch you can buy, the t-shirts and all, mm -hmm. was a tricentennial soy aromatherapy candle. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and it sold out, which I thought was just a, <laughs> an interesting mashup of the issue. And T, I want to ask you about this <coughs> in an interview with Savior Magazine. You said with Commander's Palace, you are, you've constantly been changing and you constantly are evolving the menu and the, and the restaurant, yet it is so iconic to New Orleans. Tell us a little bit about how you go about making these changes while staying true to what Commander's Palace means for the city and for your family. All right. So New Orleans food has always evolved. You know, what is gumbo? Should we just say this is it? We're never changing it again? That's not how we got where we are. And anybody who says we should take a picture of it, I'm just talking about gumbo, don't get excited. You know what I mean? <laughs> anybody who says we should just stop right there and never evolve gumbo, we would never have had speckled belly goose gumbo. We would have never, you know, I think that's fantastic. And I, and I, I hadn't thought about it the way you're actually asking it, but I mean, we try to hang on. We are respectful of the past, but never reined in by it. You know, and that's how we constantly evolve our food. And then in the neighborhoods, I, I get those changes. And I'm just so damn glad we're talking about gentrification and everybody's bitching about potholes again. Yay, that's what we're upset about. I mean, you know, the problems were so bad, you know, 10 and 12 years ago. So, but I, I, but I do think we need to be careful. I think it's thrilling. You ever drive down Royal Street and you see the French Quarter and in the distance are the tall buildings? I think that's exciting. I think the Louvre in the middle of Paris is exciting. I like the contrast. Mm -hmm. And I think we do need to keep evolving. And, uh, but, but protect the things we need to protect. I don't know how you protect a certain neighborhood and it never evolves. Every neighborhood I've ever lived in. Um, I say I live in... Um, uh, Faubourg St. John when I'm feeling fancy, but it's really just mid-city, and, and it's just <laughs> the same, you know, but, it, but it has evolved, I mean, my, you know, so it is tough, and, but I think New Orleans needs to keep evolving, but try to hang on to the, respect the things that really matter, but some of it needs to change. That's the fine line, though. I mean, I don't think that, um, I, I think neighborhoods in New Orleans should evolve, but we also have to find a way not to lose the special stuff mm -hmm. that makes these neighborhoods great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Flazel, you said something that I thought was really interesting, and I'm hoping you can give me an example, that as we're all looking forward and we're talking about investing, you said you, have to, you can't invest in the things that create negative outcomes. Mm. He's What's, so smart. He always says I'm, stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to send that check to you, T. Um, <laughs> What's yeah. an example of that well, here specifically? Listen, I think cities all across the country struggle with this, right? We think we're doing the right thing. We make public investments in strategies and actions that we think are going to keep us safe, um, going to help us grow economically. And then we find out those things actually marginalize our own people, potentially limit life outcomes and options for folk in the future. I'll give you a couple of great examples. Um, this neighborhood conversation. I grew up in Uptown, the Ferret neighborhood. Um, it was not as wealthy um, and um, as well shaped as it is now, but it was a beautiful place. I really appreciate Terry's word, a sanctuary, right? I was sort of raised by the neighborhood 
and the people in, in that neighborhood. As it turns out, New Orleans, people are our best asset. It is the thing that makes us different from, from anywhere else. Um, and so we miss the opportunity when we invest in development strategies that price out my family from living in that neighborhood, when we don't structure our investment strategies mm -hmm. in a way that allow people who are, if I could use the word indigenous, <coughs> to those neighborhoods, neighborhoods and places, people who've invested their children in families in time for generations, they ought to be able to be, be able to, uh, to, to get a shot to stay in those spaces, not just because it's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. but because it is the best and strongest and most strategic way to preserve neighborhoods and to make the city stronger. Another example is crime. We have for generations in this country, and particularly in New Orleans, most recently, the most incarcerated city in the world, no longer, um, but uh, invested in incarceration of people as a way to keep us safe. We now have both the evidence and the experience that it is not a strategy that works. We're very thankful to uh, the mayor and the city council members, but mostly to community members who pushed for the kind of reform post-Katrina, to your point about silver linings, where we were able to cut the size of the jail in half, um, reduce incarceration and arrest by tens of thousands. That's real progress made. Mm -hmm. It's a really great example of how in the past we've invested in things that don't work. We're now turning the corner in New Orleans, I think, to invest in things that work for our people. Equity is a conversation. It comes up in every conversation. And your personal story, Flo Zell, is, sort of, is interesting because it shows that equity is also about access, access to good things. And I w want you to share the story about mm -hmm. in your schooling when you were a kid, mm -hmm. the year you spent on one floor, oh, okay. and then the year you spent on another floor of your school. You really came prepared. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll try to make this short. So I grew up uptown New Orleans on Ferret Street. I went to a school called Henry W. Allen named after a Confederate general, but we won't go there today. <laughs> um, and, but it was a great, great place. Um, I walked to school every day with my neighbors. Um, we had teachers who were seasoned and experienced and who loved us. We were as likely to see those teachers, by the way, in the grocery store and the church and other places <coughs> because we actually lived in the same neighborhood um, and knew each other. And I got to the third grade and I'd always been the kid who was a little smart but also very chatty um, and a little disrespectful. <laughs> so I stayed in trouble. This is, I'm old enough to, you know, back then you got U's on your report card, right? Um, <laughs> some old people in the room, I see. Yeah. <laughs> and my mother gets asked to come to school and she says to me as we're walking in, boy, if, if ooh. Mm. She didn't actually say a whole statement, but it was just, mm, ooh. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> We get in there and the teacher says, listen, I think, I think we've got this wrong. I think he's actually really smart. I think he's capable. I think he's creative. I'd like to get him tested for gifted. We didn't know what that was, right? Um, I'm first generation college grad in my family. Um, I take the test. I do well. And overnight, I go from one floor in the building where we have to sit in chairs and sit at desks and keep quiet and be very restricted um, to the next floor where there were bean bags and plush carpets and books wall to wall and exploratory time and nap time and the, the ability to actually learn. It made me want to be a learner um, and it changed my life. It created the space for me not to just want to learn, um, but it was one of those turning points where time and time again in this community, school teachers, members of my church, um, old men sitting on milk crates, women sitting on porches, no matter where you went, members of this community were looking out and creating space and opportunity. And in some ways, the post-Katrina discussion has been, we're gonna do away with the old. And in some cases, that is, those are the things that built some of us, right? That's the space that many of us had in schools and in community that actually gave us the opportunities that we have. Mike, I wanna bring you in here because you, we're talking about <coughs> transformation and moving forward, and you transformed a space, a complete space, a little on the down low at first, right? <laughs> if we're being honest. Uh, abandoned apartment buildings, um, apartment buildings I think that had, had never been actually occupied, one of them was. Tell us a little bit about what you learned from that experience of going in to a place and transforming it that you think maybe policymakers or officials could learn from, something that you learned in that process you think could be applied 
to anything within the city government, city halls. I mean, I think it's echoing a lot of what Flozell just said about the idea that uh, there's a lot of beauty in things that would, uh, would traditionally be seen, or even from a perspective of progress, be seen as this needs to be uh, just out with the old and with the new, you know what I mean? And I think what I learned from that process is that within the idea of, of articulating, using the art to articulate why that space is beautiful, and all we did was go in and, and, and collaborate with stories that existed. We didn't walk in with this uh, blank canvas idea, like, oh, this is a blank canvas, we're gonna completely create a new. It was this idea, no, these walls aren't blank, these canvases are filled with stories, how can we collaborate with those stories? And I think that's what made the project beautiful, that's what made the project authentic, because it was a process of, of, of exploring why this is beautiful and not covering up what it was. And I think that's something that I continue to learn and, and continue to, to apply to my process as an artist, is to think about myself as a collaborator. And I think if policy, if, if those who have the best interests in the places that they're trying to do work in consider themselves collaborators and not just the savior and not just the person that's gonna come in and say, I have the answers, but how can I collaborate with what's there? And then as a collaborator, come up with answers together. I think that's what that process taught me. Mm -hmm. For, you, for you, Mike, there, there are some cities that have an artist in residence. Mm -hmm to try to reach out to people. Um, should New Orleans have one? And if so, what do you think that artists in residence could accomplish? I think that's a large part of the question that culture bearers and, and culture creators are ha having in this city, at, especially at this moment, is how can we make sure there's more culture bearers in the room? <coughs> how can we make sure that when decisions are made, because the, the, the problem I had with a lot of policy issues is that the artist is brought in as the last step. It's like after we figured it out, after we've planned it out, mm -hmm. let's reach out to the artist, to the culture, to, to the music, to basically articulate what we just came up with. And I think the, what you'll find is that when you include the artist from the beginning, when, you, when the artist has a seat at the table, mm -hmm. when the culture has a seat at the table, that there is so much more to be gained and so I think I can only see great things that would come about if, if there was an artist in resident, if there was plural artists in resident. Mm -hmm. um, I think the beauty about New Orleans is that the culture table is so rich, it's so filled, that it's, it wouldn't be, it seems like a complicated thing to just include in many rooms the culture and make sure those voices are represented and heard. Okay. There's a new mayor coming in. Maybe it could happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Terry, you are leading, let me make sure I get this right, community uh -oh. engagement efforts for NOLA? Yes. What does that mean? And what do you hope comes from this for the city? Um, it's a good question. Um, basically, what I do is uh, reach out to the community and uh, and speak on behalf of our media organization. Mm -hmm. And I think the goal is um, to remind people that we are here and we have their best interests at heart and we're part of this community as well. Mm -hmm. And um, and the things like we learned in Katrina that we report on uh, for our readers and our audience are the things that, that uh, we live with every day. Mm -hmm. You know, like in Katrina, we were journalists who were, uh, who were living the same tragedy that the people we covered lived. Mm -hmm. You know, we lost houses and uh, our families were uh, living in other states for a year while we tried to rebuild. We had to go through the road home process. And, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, th I think we're just trying to re-engage with the community. I did want to ask you about local news. I asked Walter 
before, and obviously your brother is at the New York Times, and that's a national news organization. You're a journalist on the local level, and we've seen recently local journalism have a huge impact. You know, the, the Larry Nasser story, the uh, gymnast doctor uh, <coughs> who abused all those girls, that story was broken by the Indianapolis Star, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The Flint, Michigan water story was broken by a local journalist on the ground at Det Detroit Free Press on the local public radio station there. Um, tell me about why local news will be important going forward, especially during this um, expansion and the next wave of, of new businesses and new folks coming to town? Well, we're the only people who, we live here and we know how to cover the city. And if we don't, if local journalism isn't supported, then it's, it's, it, it'll only damage us all. Um, you know, uh, the New York Times can't go to a city council meeting Mm -hmm. and let folks know that uh, um, that pothole in the, in the middle of their street is going to be fixed. They, you know, they can't do it. Um, they can't look out for the best interests of our citizenry mm -hmm. like we can. And, um, and I think local, journal, local journalism is at a crossroads. Mm -hmm. I think um, readers have to support us. And if they don't, it's to their detriment. T, I want to bring you in on the New Orleans Culinary and Hospital Institute. Is it Nochi? Nochi? Hospitality. Hospitality, excuse mm -hmm. me. Uh, a $32 million <laughs> training center for the culinary arts. In 20 years from now, what do you hope that center has accomplished? First, I'm going to tell you something else. <laughs> you may have noticed after Katrina, but we didn't actually have any political leadership. <laughs> oh. And that newspaper for a time was the greatest newspaper in America, and they helped lead this city, and that was a local newspaper, and it's true. And you know exactly what I'm talking about, and it really was amazing. Hold on. Local, that's true. Yes. And, and, it, and it's really on a good path right now in, in local, I mean, what the hell are you gonna do without local journalism? It's ridiculous. But New Orleans Culinary and Hospitality Institute is really a 52, $50 million project. It's um, one building off of formerly known as Lee Circle, and it's a 93,000 square foot facility where can you believe we don't have a major culinary institute in New Orleans? And this one's going to be culinary and hospitality. I think hospitality is something that's in the DNA in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that we can teach the world informally and formally, no matter what business you're in. But it will be a, a culinary institute. It will have workforce level training and then culinary and pastry training. Tulane is coming in and teaching hospitality entrepreneurship. And what's happening in entrepreneurship in New Orleans um, in the last, you know, 10 years has been extraordinary. And um, then we'll have my favorite part where we have the culinary enthusiasts and the beverage enthusiasts. We have Cocktail U. Mm -hmm. So you can um, come learn a little bit about cocktails and uh, actually make cocktails. And so there's going to be some fun going on, but some serious um, activity there. And uh, we broke ground about six weeks ago and Tulane will move in in November and we'll open in January, and I think it's going to be a very important institution to um, New Orleans for a long time after we're all gone. The hospitality industry is such a big driver in, in tourism and hotels and restaurants, but for a lot of folks who work at these places, they have a hard time making a living wage. What do we need to do to get it to the point when people can make a living wage and work in these fabulous places? So I think you have to sort of bifurcate the industry because most of the people that work for me, I mean, you can come be there in six months, be making $70,000. And you don't even have to have a college education to do that. You just have to work hard. So, you know, there's really no limits. Mm -hmm. um, but we were just talking before, we do struggle at times to attract enough, you know, different folks. Some people seem to not want to be in the hospitality industry. I've thought about it for a long time. And I think nobody, they think of it as demeaning because nobody wants somebody to do that to them. You know, give me the, you know. And we think of it as that it's an honor to serve people. Tonight I serve you, tomorrow night you serve me. Anyway, but, but as far as the low paying jobs, you know, you kind of have to bifurcate the industry and a little bit more, some of the fast food institutions and certain <coughs> aspects of <coughs> some of the larger institutions. It's not as much of an issue, none of us even pay minimum wage, um, you know, in, in the fine dining. 
But, you know, we do need to push that. I've always been in favor of increasing the minimum wage. You know, when the restaurant industry screams and yells, don't increase the minimum wage, don't listen to them. You know, it's never been a problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. Every time they call me for a quote, I'm like, I'm not going to say what you want because I think we should raise it, you know. <laughs> and um, so I believe in all that. It should, should go up from time to time. Absolutely. And, you know, some very basic things like that. But the more we can train people, the more there are no limits for them. And it's one of the greatest starter industries in America. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the city and crime. Any city that's trying to attract business and that has a high crime rate has to deal with it. Um, what, obviously no city wants crime. What's the issue? Why can't New Orleans get a handle on it? They had a really rough year last year mm -hmm. in 2017. I can remember the first time I ever came to report on New Orleans was 1994. Oh yeah. And that horrible of, year, yeah. that really tough year. Mm -hmm. um, what needs to be done? Is it gun control? Is it more police? What do we need to do? Mm. It, you know, I would venture that part of the story, the 300-year story of this city, includes not only the, the amazing kind of mixture, melange of cultures and people and all of the things that make people come to New Orleans, right? One of my colleagues in philanthropy calls it the cultural hub of America. Uh, we also have built an exceptional economy um, along the lines of race. And in particular, uh, we don't talk about this because it's uncomfortable. The, the, the New Orleans economy historically, and I would say the country's economy, has been built on free labor. We were, according to the historic New Orleans collection and some historians, the place with the largest um, slave trade of people of African descent in the country during the domestic slave trade. Mm -hmm. Enormous wealth was built We've never reconciled the equitable engagement of that wealth and what it means for every other part of the conversation that we're having, jobs, business ownership, housing, Education. participation in democracy, the delivery of justice, the ability to, to be an American. Um, and until we deal with that, those issues that are fundamental, um, I think it's generational work of opening those spaces, being really truthful about not just um, what relationships we're in and how it is that we deal with issues um, that come up between people, but how do we fundamentally measure our ability for people to participate writ large in the ways that I'm talking about? We're going to have crime as a byproduct. Mm -hmm. The same with health outcomes and other things, and we have to think about it that way. Uh, beefing up the police is not going to necessarily help. Uh, doing all the things that we've done in the past or recreating them we already know that mass incarceration doesn't help eliminate crime. What is going to help is edifying and lifting up and building families, giving children and their parents an opportunity to live well. Those are the kind of things that we know um, can really help us ameliorate some of the crime issues. And if you think about when you first came to the city in 94, I worked in the mayor's office from 96 to 99, we were dealing with those issues. And what helped us is not just beefing up the police, those were the Clinton years. We were able to invest in families. We were able to invest in housing. We were able to invest in education and other things that really gave New Orleanians a chance to step away from the things that created crime to create some other opportunities for themselves. You gotta give people a chance. You gotta give them a chance. I'm going to ask one more question and then have the microphones out to the floor. Hopefully we'll get in one or two more questions. Mike, I wanted to ask you this. You know, there's been a lot of discussion nationally about young people and young people leading the way, obviously, on this gun control debate. Um, of the young artists that you work with, and I'm guessing you're the youngest guy on the panel. Um, <laughs> it's me. <laughs> um, what do they want to see for New Orleans going forward? I mean, they're going to be the adults in the next 50 years. Hmm. I mean, when you, when you, I'm a big fan of history, and when you look at history, you got to acknowledge that history is a continuum. It's, it's not isolated moments, but it hmm. continues. And I always like to think about it like a relay race, and the baton is passed from generation to generation. And I think this younger generation acknowledges not only the responsibility of the past, but also how the new tools available ha are helping and amplifying the goal. Mm. And I, when, when I see the youth in New Orleans, I see a lot of uh, courage and, and ingenuity in the context of, of, of seeing what's possible. Mm. I think New Orleans, 
good and bad has always existed in a space where the, the present is the most important, where the, it's about being, which is why my projects have always been Project B, Exhibit B, Studio B, because about the beauty of now. It's not about saying, okay, five years from now, tomorrow. It's like, what am I going to eat today? Like, what, what can I do today? That's, you know, that's what's beautiful about New Orleans. But I think the youth and the generation are, are, are looking forward and they're saying, okay, how am I going to grow and, 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 and be able to exist beyond today? And I think that's something that is beautiful to see in terms of how those challenges are being met with the creativity. Mm -hmm. And there are challenges. I mean, one can argue, <coughs> are the conditions, do the conditions exist for another trombone shorty to, to, to happen? Mm -hmm. and, and that's arguable. Mm -hmm. I mean, because when you think about the Treme neighborhood, when you think about the conditions that produce that, that genius, mm -hmm. does it still exist? And I think in balance of that, the youth are finding ways to, to still produce the creativity to still grow, to still be those seeds that continue to develop. And so I have great courage and confidence that the youth are going to lead the way to what the city should be. Yes, sir. All right, let's take a couple questions. We're out of time, but we're going to take a couple anyway. Go. Good morning. My name is Bernardette Chiffin. I'm the owner of Senica. We're an artisanal body care brand. Ms. Stewart mentioned the, uh, the Tricentennial <laughs> Aromatherapy Candle. Yeah. <laughs> that is actually made by my company. We're not sold out. Just go to 2018. <laughs> 2018NOLA.com and proceeds do benefit the 2018 NOLA Foundation. Now, I am a transplant from the Caribbean. So I grew up I'm from Dominique, and I grew up um, on the yeah. island of St. Croix, which is in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. You may have heard about it during the hurricane season. So what happened um, in my community and is happening here in New Orleans, you see <coughs> a lot of transplants and a lot of e expats, and then you do have that um, co-mingling of cultures and so forth that then creates a new um, a new way of life and sometimes that's separate, separated. And um, you talked about really embracing the culture of New Orleans and I've settled into New Orleans because it's very similar to Caribbean culture. But at the same time, I also learned to make gumbo from my New Orleans mom on Jenna Street <laughs> that was yeah. born and raised in New Orleans. So my question to you guys is how can we that are transplants and that we, um, those that are also born and raised, be better collaborators in terms of being able to maintain the culture that makes New Orleans rich so that we're not having a gumbo with like asparagus and so forth, which could be good. <laughs> it could be good, you know, and kale, you know, but how can we, okay. how can we be better, be better um, collaborators? And this is gonna have to be our final question, whoever wants to take the answer. I mean, to me, it just get in and engage. It almost doesn't matter what, you know, I mean, I just started doing things that very early on, a bunch of us probably at your age were upset at how negative New Orleanians were about New Orleans. And we got together and started this thing called Proud to Call It Home, which it still lives on mostly in bumper stickers, but it's still <laughs> out there. But it was making us realize that we were harming our city by being overly negative. So we gave out positive facts and we did all this stuff. But it didn't matter how you engage. You sound like somebody who will. So pick a way and just engage, like he said, collaborate. And I would add, have some standards. You can't have asparagus in the gumbo. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> are some rules we're not going to change. Some, some things will not change. Let's thank our panel. <laughs>